Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here this week with Helen Knight. Um, Helen, I'm so happy that you're here with us because I, I feel like you offer a service that uh, a lot of people really care about, especially my audience um, of the More Life podcast. These are creative entrepreneurs, and, and you have a great service of helping people find their, their best types of clients in their niche and helping their agencies thrive and creative businesses thrive. Please introduce yourself, let people know exactly what you do. Welcome to the More Life podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, my name's Helen Knight. I'm the creative lead consultant for Creative Business Brain. And um, I really set up the business to help designers and agencies. Originally, it was creative people in general, and then I've narrowed it down. <laughs> but um, yeah, designers and agencies, um, I used to be a designer. So they're the types of people I can really relate to. I know the struggles. I know how hard it is when you first start out. Mm -hmm. um, I literally struggled for years um, until I found out the best ways to build your business and how to get that consistency, which is what most people struggle with the most, you know, the big sort of dips and um, the big intakes of huge, huge um, amounts of projects and then nothing for ages. <laughs> you know, I used to live like that for so many years and my partner as well, because we're both creatives. We're both, he used to be a designer too. So uh, can you imagine both of us living like that all the time? <laughs> like um, we used to drive each other crazy. Yes. So. <laughs> We're still together, though. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one problem with what you just said. What do you mean he used to be a designer? Uh, I think you're still yeah. a designer. You're st I feel design is like creative <laughs> problem solving, and you're still doing that. Okay. You are a designer. Now you're, you're, you're more of a architect of systems, and maybe that's maybe yeah. more appropriate. But you're still a designer. I'm sure if I give you okay, access to Photoshop, you. you'll be all right. <laughs> Oh, I've still got the creative suite, yeah. Yeah, see, if Adobe is still charging <laughs> yeah. your credit card, then you are for are. sure a designer. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, well, I guess I don't think of it like that because I don't really have time to do that kind of stuff anymore. But, um, yeah, I do love it still. I still draw. Um, I've still got loads of canvases and things around me, like yeah, all bits of things that we're making and creating. Mm -hmm. So we are creative people, you know, at heart. So... But yeah, I'm I'm determined to help people and stop that struggle because it's so common. It's just like we lived like that for yeah. years, and it was so hard. And I just don't want other people to go through that. So I know we we're gonna we're gonna um, start at the to... we're gonna start at the front end of the story. But just before we do that, you just mentioned something like, isn't it amazing mm -hmm. when you really find your your lane, like your calling, because it's very much your persona about like your personality and your, your helpfulness and um, how you come across on social media, on Instagram, specifically where I follow you. Um, and it's like, you're so in your element. It's like, I don't, I couldn't imagine you doing something, anything else. Like if you told me you were a bank teller, I'd say, nah, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I am. I, I've totally found my calling. Um, it's taken me a long time, but yeah, it's been worth the journey. Um, and now you're here yeah, to help totally. us. And I absolutely love it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely love it. And I thrive on it. And just like calls that I've had with clients today, I've just been so excited for them. Even like halfway through um, a call as well with a client today, and he got feedback that he uh, got his first big win. And we were both like, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> really excited together and just yeah it was just amazing um that kind of experience i just love seeing people evolve and and being really close to that and show you know showing them um making a big difference that's all that's important yeah. to me really so let's start at the beginning um how did you start in this industry because i know you mentioned you were a designer um maybe doing more traditional design work where it's branding or graphic design or web um let's hear about the early mm -hmm. years for helen and, and the art okay. artistry and how that all came about yeah okay so yeah i was a graphic designer um i graduated in 2002 from derby university in the uk and um i was I was a slightly older student because I, I went to sick form as well. Um, so I did it the long route anyway. Mm -hmm. So even that bit was the long route. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did A-levels and, and I did, um, and then I went to college and did a BTEC national diploma in graphics. Then I did a university degree 
um, as well. Got to one. Um, I think my only downfall was my writing because I've never been good at writing until now. Yeah. Now I'm amazing at copywriting, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was never good at um, yeah explaining myself in, in written words. Um, I just wasn't very good at it. And so, yeah, my dissertation was my downfall. Otherwise, I would have got a first. But right. anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. And I um, after university, I just felt a bit lost. Like I think a lot of people do. Um, I don't know what it's like in where you live, but in the UK, there's never that much guidance or there never was when I left in 2002. There wasn't yeah. a lot of guidance after university. I literally got on um, got onto the computer searched loads of agencies, sent my CV out to hundreds of people and sat and waited. And that's kind of all I did. And I didn't really know what, what else to do. And that's all they prepared you um, for, is just, just do those things, send out the resume and mm. wait to see what happens. Yeah, and it was very painful. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a lot of responses. <laughs> We've all been there. Um, yeah, I did get a few interviews. Um, I ended up working... Uh, what was my first job was in house at a um, like a car. Uh, what do you call it? Like a, a place where they promote cars. So it was um, what you're doing like car listings uh, yes. and car adverts in the newspaper Got and that it. kind of thing. So that was what I did. Um, not very exciting. No, but it was a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it was a start, and um, and I just. I stayed, I didn't even stay there that long because it was really boring. I stayed there for about seven months and then decided to have another go at looking for something else where I could be a bit more creative. Yeah. And then I got a job in-house with, um, it was a plastics company. So they made um, like um, things of, that they sell in Toys R Us and things they sell in mother care, yeah. uh, baby products, all that kind of stuff, um, garden products. So I would do all the packaging which was great. So that was like my first decent job, really. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did packaging. I did actually did a lot for that company because I was the creative. So I had my own office, which was lovely. Yeah. They bought me a brand new spanking computer with a massive big screen. Ooh. I was in my element. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, so, so you, um, you, you've, you had a lot of, um, you know, cutting your teeth uh, on, on, you know, lots of life experiences. There's, uh, yeah. and the beauty of it is at, in, at the time when you're in those moments, it's kind of like, oh man, I really want to get a better job. Cause you know, you're kind of dreaming the whole time when you're in school about how great it's going to be. It's going to be so amazing. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's kind of becomes, uh, kind of like, oh, this is not what I thought it was, but you end up learning so much in some of those, um, not as extravagant, you know, jobs or those type of positions, <laughs> but you learn the skills. Maybe that's where you hone in on your, your keyboard shortcuts or, you know, how to run yeah. scripts in Photoshop because you have to do the exact same thing 45,000 45, times. I first learned <laughs> how to do that in Photoshop batch work um, just because I was as a photo editor uh, out of college and it was not fun and you know you get 2000 photos and you have to get 150 selects out of it and like this is going to yeah. take forever so you learn how to do a lot of little little <laughs> things you, you and the, uh, over the amounts of years or months or however long it is you end up accumulating all these additional tools which i call real tools because they teach you technical tools in, 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 in school. Um, but then the stuff you use in practice and every day that only comes with real life experience, that's the stuff you kind of accumulate over time. Um, but that's really, that's yeah. really impressive. Um, in terms of the stick to itiveness that you've had. And at some point along the way, you, you made enough mistakes <laughs> to have graduated to, to help others, to help other people kind of figure out what they want to do or, or how to achieve mm -hmm. those things that they want to do. So how did that transition and transformation take place? Um, yeah. So the transition from being a designer to helping other people. Um, yeah. So I, after that job, I am um, trying to think what I did next. So after that job, I was, um, 
working at another at a couple of agencies after that and then I decided to have my own business because when I'd worked with agencies that's a whole different ball game than working in house and I and I was basically working really hard even all night sometimes or like um working at the agency till two in the morning mm -hmm. then them expecting you to be there early in the morning again and it was just like crazy and I'd I just thought I can run a business better than this <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> I decided to set up on my own. The company that I was working with at the time weren't doing very well. Right. Um, they they just couldn't get the work in. Um, and I actually started, when I started um, the job that I left before I started my own business, I started thinking I was joining a team that I thought I was going to learn a lot from. And I was really excited because I thought, oh, I'm going to learn from all these other really experienced designers. And when I got there, there was one lady left. Uh -oh. There was one, one lady. <laughs> and um, and then there was me. And <laughs> they obviously hired me because I was cheaper because I was still Young. Kind of, you know, junior or whatever. And, um, yeah, still at early stages. And they were trying to keep their business going. So... Uh, yeah, it was working. Like they was working us really, really hard. Um, it was ridiculous. And in the end, um, the company um, just said, you know, that we haven't got enough work in. So I decided, okay, that's fine. I'm going to start my own business. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I, I at, at first, I was like, oh my god, what I'm going to do? I was like really panicking because back then, I was really shy. I was like not the same person I am now. Yeah. I was like. I had anxiety. I was like rubbish at talking to people. I couldn't <laughs> hold a conversation. I was. <laughs> look at you go. <laughs> like, sorry. I said, look at you go now. Where did I go? <laughs> <laughs> so that person has evolved dr drastically and dramatically from, I guess, throwing myself out of my comfort zone and having to really make things happen uh, from being in pretty. Um, yeah, worrying and stressful situations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had to make it work. Um, I had to start making money. I wasn't living at home. I was living uh, with friends. Like, I had to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. um, I had to, you know, I had bills. Um, so I was, like, really worried. Uh, I remember crying with my friend. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and yeah, it was, it was really hard because I was only, how old was I? I think I was about 23 at the time, maybe 22, 23. And I just thought, right, I can do this. Just, you know, put my, put my brave, um, suit of armor on and right. just go for it. And I, I, I actually asked a lot of people, um, uh, back then it was way before Facebook. So if you imagine like trying to start a business back then was literally going to your local um, registrar chamber of commerce. Yeah. It was all that kind of thing, you know, just asking for advice. They sent me to Prince's Trust, which was a big help. So the Prince's Trust in the UK, if anybody's listening in the UK, they still do this scheme, which is fantastic. So I've recommended it to loads of um, people just starting out. If you literally have no funding at all, and you're, you're starting from scratch and you have no money, they will give you a grant. And oh, um, awesome. when I did it, it was a loan, so I had to pay it back. But I think it's a grant now, which is even better. Wow. Um, and it was £5,000. So I got a £5,000 loan from Prince's Trust, bought my computer, bought my software. Back then, I don't know if anybody's listening that's old school, but I had to buy Quark Express, which Quark was £1,000 on its own. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I learned in school, Quark yeah. Express. Yeah, um, I had to, yeah, I had to buy all the old school stuff. And I literally set up in my bedroom, um, going to network events, petrified, mm -hmm. really scared, really nervous, um, to try and do my best to talk to people. Yeah, <laughs> and it's hard. that was how it started, yeah. It's really hard. So um, really, really hard. And then... Um, I, I just kept going. I was so determined. I'm probably the most stubborn person you'll ever meet. <laughs> uh, I never give up on anything. If I feel like I can do something, even if it's not working straight away, I just keep going. And that's how I think you've really got to be determined if you want to make something work. Um, Especially nowadays with everybody um, on the same path. Like everyone's um, 
has a social media presence. Everybody is a quote unquote photographer because of, you know, iPhones. Everybody has mm. a podcast. Everybody has a YouTube channel. Everyone has something they're promoting that they're doing that they're talking about out loud to others. So if you don't mm. actually have that determination to kind of carve out your own space, you're going to get washed in with everybody else because everyone is doing that. Mm. Everyone has their thing that they're trying to promote. So how long, yeah. Helen, have you been running this, uh, this business? So the business that I run now, yeah. um, helping other designers and agencies. So I first, um, my first online business wasn't actually a design or anything to do with design related business, but it was because I just wanted an online business to learn how to have an online business, if that makes yep. sense. Yep. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to go through the process and, and find out what was possible. And I tried all kinds of things. Um, and cause I'm also, uh, my background with my partner is like, uh, running, um, kickboxing clubs as well. So that's what he does. Cool. Um, and yeah, so I started actually in the online world in a sort of health, fitness, weight loss, um, mindset kind of way mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, evolved from there. Uh, but that was how I learned so much about building a business online. Um, I had loads of coaching. I joined loads of programs. Mm -hmm. um, you name it, I was there. I literally joined everything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and just realized what an exciting opportunity that people have now to build an online business. It's right. just like so different from when I first started my design business. And the things that are available now online is just a totally different world. And it's just so much easier now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really so good. If anybody's, trying to, yeah, if anybody's trying to build a business now, um, you compare it to no, no internet, compare it to no Facebook. <laughs> um, you're in a really great place. So yeah. we are living in I the greatest time you. in the world just because of mm. the amount of tools, like how long it would take you to, you know, to, like we, we do branding and web design. That's our, our niche here. Um, yeah. how long it would take you to build a website before and then geo cities i don't know if they had that in the uk back in the day maybe early 2000s 2001 2002 where you can build sites mm. but even that it was all html and code and java um and you had to yeah. even as a young person had to know that i was in high school you had to kind of like navigate and go in forums or, or chat rooms back then before we had forums really to find pieces of yeah. code to make something do what you want it to do and it's we have yeah. so much opportunity now with you know the advent of social media and the smartphone and and you know just how much TikTok has blown up and everyone has a platform and if someone were to tell me mm -hmm. that i could speak to a thousand people on a regular basis on my social media i would say no way you're you're crazy you know if someone told me that 20 years ago that how could i ever do that but you're able to do that on a regular basis, if not more, if not 10,000. Some people have 20 or 100 or a million people that they communicate to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And the big yeah. number or the number that everyone focuses on is not always the most important one. Um, no. I think it's, you know, more about the engagement, that community aspect. If people really like either mm -hmm. the concepts, the things that you're teaching them or showing them or the personality that you have, that's what's going to attract people to kind of, um, stay on board. It has to be one of those two things. Either they're, they're learning something or they like your, your, your approach in teaching or sharing information or having mm -hmm. conversations, or they like your personality and they want that person, that, that relationship. But either way, if your goal is to grow, you know, the audience is key. And right now we live in the perfect era for audience. Um, I don't know how people would have <laughs> done it, you know, anytime before now <laughs> to have this type of audience and retention. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it's so exciting. Um, it, yeah, it is literally just, um, being able to pick an audience that, you know, you can resonate with and, and be just be yourself. You know, if you can be yourself and be honest and open and be excited and passionate about helping somebody that's, you know, that's a massive, deal to somebody that's mm -hmm. struggling right now you know if you really want to help them you show passion and you can show that you've been on a similar journey to them or you can just resonate they can resonate with what you're telling them um and you, it's clear that you have a solution it's clear that you've got a pathway for them to follow then you know that's what you're really gonna um 
you're really going to get a lot of people following you yeah. and, and talking to you, reaching out to you. If it's really obvious that you've got the answer to something that they want. Yeah. I think people are looking for genuine connection. I don't, people mm -hmm. don't want to be sold to by some like uh, snake oil salesman. Yeah. They want something that's like, okay, I understand this. They seem to have done this before and I can track with them. Um, but if mm -hmm. it seems uh, sketchy or sleazy, people don't want to be involved with that. Um, there was that era, you know, on, on YouTube, um, people kind of just talking in circles in terms of how they could help you, but not actually telling you anything of what they would actually do. And people buying these mm. courses at a thousand dollars and or more or, or whatever the price is. And, and I think people now are so um, tired of the manufactured hype. And so now they're looking for that genuine response, genuine community. Um, but yeah, you're, you talk to people a lot, different types of people in different industries, and you helping them find yeah. their audience, helping them get bigger sales and leads. What are you seeing mm -hmm. in the industry right now? What are some of the needs that you see or commonalities that you see with creatives and an agency that are trying to level up, go to the next stage? Um, okay. So... Oh, there's lots of commonalities. There's things like um, if you're talking about individuals, um, like people, obviously with the COVID situation, there's all kinds of things that have happened. So a lot of people have either lost their jobs or they've um, they've just decided that, um, you know, life is too short and they want more freedom and they want to work from home mm -hmm. or whatever because they've had a taste of that from going on, um, what do they call it, furlough, mm -hmm. things like that. You know, they've had a taste of working independently. They're like, right. I've decided I want to build my own business now. Yeah. <laughs> I've had people like that before. Yeah. Um, I've had um, people that um, have been trying to um, have their own agency for a long time that um, have, but they just are. Yeah. Some, some of my clients have been busy like before they met me, but they're busy with the wrong types of projects. So they're busy with a lot of work that's low paid. Right. So, they, they can get a lot of work, but it's not high paid work. So they're really tied out. And this, that was what happened to me with my business, my first business um, with design. I was busy, but I was so tied out. I was working my socks off um, and I had to network with other freelancers to help to obviously um, delegate some of the work. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I met my partner because that's <laughs> on a creative um, website. Oh, that's how I met that's him. So cute. <laughs> Yeah, are we still together now? Like, uh, I think it's 15 years ago that was. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. so you guys <laughs> met on like a forum type of thing? Like you guys were like a community board where people were, were helping each yeah. other? Yeah, it's like a, a creative uh, industry network website with a forum thing. And, and um, I just put a post on there saying that uh, I was looking for freelancers to help because I was getting busy. Um, but the trouble was that I was getting busy, but it wasn't really well paid. Um, right. So, yeah, that's what I struggle with the most. But, yeah, I meet a lot of people like that that, that have a lot of work, but they're maybe they're um, also connecting their own self-worth with, with what they can charge. I see that a lot. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely me as well. I used to not feel that I was good enough to charge more than whatever, you know, than the average um, freelancer. Um, yeah, I just didn't think people would pay it. I didn't, and I meet people like that all the time. I did a testimonial video with a guy, um, a couple of days ago, for, he, he lives in Portugal and he's a, um, a digital consultant. Um, he does amazing websites and all sorts of things. He's, um, he was telling me that when we first met, his self-worth was so low and he just didn't feel that he could charge, um, like over a thousand pounds for what he was doing. I was like, what? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, yeah. And now he's got like the biggest projects he's ever had in his life. And he said, he's so happy. He's just so excited about the whole thing. Um, so yeah, um, that's a really good one. I can't wait yeah. to edit that and post that on my YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know yeah. what? I feel like you mm. said something re right there that was, um, almost like, it feels like a rite of passage because everyone goes through it where you're selling yourself short. Uh, I work in a co-working yeah. space and there's a young designer who was working here um, in the open, uh, I guess, communal space. And she was kind of just asking some questions about what I do. And I'm like, I've been right where you're at. 
where you don't you don't think you're actually good enough to charge those prices but you have mm. to you have to um you have to treat yourself like don't treat yourself like you know yourself take yourself out of the equation and think objectively mm. at what you're doing and price it appropriately yeah. how much time am i putting in how much time am i going to do in terms of revisions what caliber of work am i doing in the in the scheme of uh, or the gamut of my industry, because she she's a creative artist, somebody who draws um, digitally, mm-hmm. and 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 find a happy medium, find where the highest, you know, maybe call a few people, find where the lowest, and mm-hmm. place yourself um, as you see the work based on the data. Because if you go on your emotion, yeah. you're gonna end up underselling yourself. Um, and it's very mm. discouraging when you're young and you're working like really late into the day and into the night and yeah. you still don't have enough money because, you know, and yeah. it's very, very challenging. That was me. <laughs> yeah, that was me for so many years. And um, I wish there were I wish there was that support that there is now. Like there's obviously a lot more support there is now yes. um, on the Internet. But in those days, nobody spoke was... about money about how they were charging it was a secret a massive massive secret yeah Yeah. how much money did you charge on that or how much money did you make on that is nobody gave you the answer (laughs) no it was tough it was tough and and to get to just to talk to people that understood your situation uh obviously i had the prince's trust that was it but no one specifically for design there was no one i I couldn't find anyone to talk to i remember a couple college mates who um got a agency job um, before I did. So right out of college, my college professor hired me at a print shop he owned um, to do some pre-flight like stuff before it gets to the printer, fixing of some, of some technical or digital files. Um, and I had friends who had got agency jobs and uh, they were freelancing on the side. I was freelancing on the side. And I remember asking them saying, hey, what, what, are, the, what are the metrics or what, what, what things are you using to determine the pricing and they would give like these weird answers and talk around the situation, but they never actually said, Oh, I just go based off time or I have a set price list. And if I feel it's going to go beyond my normal scope, I'll add 25%. Like they didn't have any metrics. And now if you look at like, um, especially on YouTube, there are so many Mm -hmm. YouTubers and influencers who talk about how much money they make. I know it's harder with like brand deals. They can't disclose that information, but in terms of how much yeah. money YouTube or how much money AdSense pays them out yearly or monthly, there are so many people who talk about it and they say, Hey, this is possible. Mm-hmm. Here's how I did it. And here's how you can do it. We also grew up yeah. I feel like we're in the similar age bracket. Um, I'm 35 where we kind of, um, uh, uh, grew up in I'm the a bit older. Pardon? <laughs> I'm a bit older. <laughs> I'm, for- <laughs> I'm going to be 43 this year. Oh, so. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. But we grew up in the same era where people didn't talk mm. like that. And it kind of seemed like mm. if I helped you, you would get ahead of me. And the mm. uh, younger generation is so much more collaborative where, you know, you have mm. these big YouTube or Instagram presences who collaborate with their exact competitors because they can see the yeah. mutual benefit in it. And they see that if, if mm. we can work something out, the audience wins, we win, I win and you win all three of us all win. Yeah. Right. So it's That's really cool it. to see how the younger generation collaborate more, but back then it didn't exist at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's it's great. And I love talking to other people that are that have got a similar audience to me. You know, it does. Um, it's definitely a good game plan. I mean, it, I wouldn't rely on it, but it's definitely um, you know part of the picture. Definitely important to, mm-hmm. to um, network with those types of people as well. Definitely. Yeah. In terms of mm-hmm. like prospecting, you know, even until last year, I don't think I knew what I was doing, and then. I, I found solace in a business coach that I had. Um, shout out to Dave Shrine, who was on uh, season one of the podcast. And he talked about how so many businesses follow the same kind of steps where you're you're kind of just trying to stay afloat your first year. And then your, your second year, mm-hmm. you make all the mistakes. You do all the wrong things. And then the third year, you kind of say, I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z anymore because it really 
hurt the business or burn me out or cost me money mm -hmm. or opportunities. And once you eliminate yeah. the fluff and you're left with what remains, that's when you kind of realize what you should be doing. Um, and that was me mm -hmm. about 18 months ago um, with prospecting. And uh, I spoke with another person who was, has been, everyone I find who's really cool, I put on the podcast. So Mike Mall on season two um, talked to me about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, prospecting on LinkedIn, making custom videos, um, sharing them with people, um, helping them initially and having deeper conversations um, with mm -hmm. them. And that revolutionized how I used uh, LinkedIn specifically. Um, and we kind of well, not gave up, but we kind of just like didn't put as much effort in other social media platforms because LinkedIn became so lucrative um, for us. And then what happens afterwards mm -hmm. is where I feel like the magic sauce mm -hmm. happens that we've really um, through many years of mistakes and doing all kinds of crazy things have refined our, <laughs> our, our, our prospecting and lead generation process. So we go through and we identify um, somebody will either, if it's a cold uh, transaction that we're doing, we'll talk with them and, and find out uh, uh, if we could be of help, send them a personalized message, show them something. Um, and if they actually want to connect, I'll send them the Calendly link. But before the Calendly link, there's a form. And in the form, we make sure the decision maker is on there. Um, we make sure what their budget is. We find out how much money they made in the last year because we try to stay in the commercial um, small to medium sized business range. So we aim Mm -hmm. for like anywhere between 200,000 to 300,000, this is Canadian dollars, um, uh, mm -hmm. companies that make at least that in the revenue, if not higher, um, at least three to four people on staff, if not more, uh, and make sure that the key decision maker is on the call because we're going to ask um, real tough um, or at, at least insightful goal-centered questions. And the more you drive mm -hmm towards the root of what the real goal is, the better it is that I can determine whether we are aligned and I can actually help you. And if that connection is there, it's almost a guarantee to get um, a sale out of that call because we've put a couple of processes in place. You know, we then follow up with them, do a presentation of our proposal instead of just sending them a PDF. And in that presentation, mm -hmm. they start to see exactly how we're going to help them based on their goals, based on what they said before. And, and that mm -hmm. once we started doing that process, it was, if you've made it that far, there's no way you're saying no. You know what I mean? Like it, you, there's no way you're turning back after we've made you the proposal before I would spend three to five hours a week, just on proposal writing, just for somebody to mm -hmm. not read it and get back to me. <laughs> 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 oh gosh, yeah. Uh, do you, do you see that as that well with people with with um with prospecting and trying to get new clients that they're kind of spinning their wheels until they figure something out? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, people usually come to me because they've tried just about everything. Like they've they tell me they've tried messaging, they've tried sending um, examples of what they do. You know, they've tried. Um, um, like just networking more, talking to people and asking for referrals, all that kind of stuff. And they just don't know what to do. Um, yeah, most people say to me, oh, I just rely on referrals. Um, even I've even talked to agencies that have been going like 20 years and they still tell me they haven't got a process to get their clients, which is absolutely crazy. And they just, <laughs> it's just, it really is crazy because now, especially after COVID, when they've lost uh, probably a huge amount of their business, like a lot of them say, oh, we've just lost like half of our business because like one of the, one of our clients was like our main income. So they're, they're relying on uh, big contracts, but not very many of them. So when that goes, that's a big hit and they haven't got a way of getting consistency back into the business quickly. So they, they just haven't got a clue how to get uh, the right people through the door again. Oh, I can't. Can't hear you. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. I hit the mute button. It. It's it's 2021, and <laughs> okay. I still haven't figured out how to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> we've been on Zoom now for two years. <laughs> um, so many people are stuck in that same loop, though, where they have mm. zero um, ways, like 
systematized ways. Like this is my process. Like what I just did, it took me about what, two minutes mm -hmm. to kind of throw it out there and to say specifically what we do to prospect clients. Most people I talk mm -hmm. to do not have that. Um, wow. What would you say to people to like, who, who need to start? Because uh, I'm in the process of writing a course going from freelance to agency, just because that's what I've done in the last three years. And mm. um, I feel like there's a lot of freelance photographers and writers and designers who have a, I, who have a product, but don't have a business. My product is I provide mm. writing services, but how do I translate that into an agency? How do I translate that into a business model that operates without me? That's what I think is um, a major goal for a lot of people where they're like, I can go on vacation or take maybe three days off and go to a cottage and relax for a little bit. And decisions are being made. Things are happening in the business that I don't mm. have to specifically do. Um, if somebody is a freelancer, Helen, how would you tell mm -hmm. them to start to systematize a way to attract or what the best method is for them to get some new people other than just referrals? Yeah. Okay. So I would say the first phase is all about um, just identifying who you're really talking to. So obviously um, I would highly recommend using social media because that's what I'm all about. And I feel like um, you need to really identify who you're talking to, what you're doing for them and what that's really going to do for their business. So once you've done that and you've positioned yourself in a way where you're the obvious answer to that specific person's problem, you got your miles ahead already. So mm. if that's so super clear that you could, um, you know, a five-year-old could understand it, then, <laughs> then people are going to reach out to you just from that. If you get that spot on, yeah. people can reach out to you just from getting that right. Okay. Cause I get, it, I get it all the time. Um, now obviously that I do a lot of other things as well. Um, it's important to obviously make sure your profile is aligned to them as well. So it really resonates with them as soon as they land on it. And you're talking um, like if you if there's like an about section in, let's say you're on LinkedIn, for instance, that you are um, talking about how they feel first, not about you. So I know the about section is typically meant to be about you. Right. But if you want to really draw people in, it's got to be about them first. So they know they're in the right place. So that's another big, um, big thing you need to work on. Um, you also need to make sure that you have a very clear understanding of uh, lead generation through some kind of platform. So deciding, uh, really researching your ideal audience, finding out all about them so you know them inside mm -hmm. out and understanding where they hang out the most. What so, type of platform uh, would you suggest? Just throw some out there that people could look into. Like you said, yeah, platform so, for um, like lead generation platform, is that like HubSpot or Salesforce? Um, um, so no, just, just any social media platform where you it. feel your ideal client hangs out. So if it's Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, or wherever you feel they are the most, because um, obviously um, some, types of businesses are, are more on LinkedIn, some are more on Facebook, 100%. like coaches hang out more on Facebook. Um, if you want to target coaches, I would say Facebook. If you want to target designers, obviously um, Instagram mm -hmm. and LinkedIn. LinkedIn's more agencies. Um, so yeah, um, it's really working out where your people hang out the most. Um, really learn that platform, understand that platform really, really well, <laughs> so that you know all the tips and tricks for that platform. Um, and then it's really important that you know what you're offering them. So once you've done the research and you've worked out everything about them, um, you've really got to understand their journey, what it's like to be them. You're going to create an offer that gives them everything they want and everything they need. So you've got to be, you've got to realize they're not going to be aware of certain things along their journey. At the moment, the moment you meet them will be when they've got this big problem that's on their mind all the time, right. something that's like keeping them awake at night. And that's the thing you need to focus on. So focus on that first and then think about their journey. Where are they going? All the other things they're going to need, all the hurdles they've got to get over to achieve the thing that they really want the most. And you're going to create an amazing offer for them. Now, um, 
that is obviously quite a high high level skill thing yeah. to do. Um, but yeah, it, it, obviously that's just giving you a, a very brief framework. Don't give them all the secret sauce, yes, Helen. Let them. Let them, let them <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna send them to you so that they can call you and find out how exactly should they get this type of help in their business. But you yeah. you said something really good. The profile is. It took me until uh, um, somebody sh uh, mentioned this, you know, I, I, I don't know who to give mm -hmm. credit to, where somebody mentions this, write the, your, your social media profiles the way that you search social media profiles, right? The way that mm -hmm. when I go to somebody else's social media, what am I looking yeah. to find out? That's how you yeah. should write it for for the person who's going to be looking this up. So when I find somebody yeah. who's a very good interior designer, uh, I go to their profile mm -hmm. because I want to find out what's their website, where are they, or which city do they live in, what specific mm -hmm. type of interior is it commercial, is it modern, is it what 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 type of stuff are we talking about, and that's what I'm looking for in the profile. So that's mm -hmm. how I should approach my profile. I should put the location, yeah. spe specify not not just say designer. It should say something very specific. We do branding and web design for construction and interior designers. That's very specific mm -hmm. of what we do. And then how do people, how do I want people to connect with me? It needs to be something uh, um, that's easy, whether it's the website right there that goes to a specific page built for them. Mm -hmm. Like those are the type of things that, oh, reverse it. What do you do? Do that for your, for those who might be looking for you, who might find you on the explore page. And that's how you're going mm -hmm. to actually use Instagram the way that the people who started it intended it. Like it's for that discovery and that exploration and that sharing and community. Yeah. And that's what you need to actually do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another thing to mention about that is when you're, when you're looking at profiles, it's also important to, um, to, to just kind of think about, like you said, about the language that they would use rather than um, than approaching them with your technical language. So if you're doing content, for instance, and you're trying to relate to someone, they, they probably won't really be focused on the things you're focused on because yeah. your world is totally set, di totally different to their world. And you've got to just imagine what it's like to be in their world. And you've got to bridge the gap between their world and your world. So that's the that's the thing most people get wrong. Most people just talk about um, why you need branding, mm -hmm. but that person might not even be thinking about branding. <laughs> They're thinking about the problem that they've got right now. Hundred percent. They have no idea they need branding. <laughs> that's not an so, issue. Yeah. yeah, it's very yeah, it's very unique it. right now in the mm -hmm. world that we live because we like we put so much information online, and people search yeah. for that type of stuff, or people are come across it however which way and and there's there's something to be said like okay I, i'm putting all this information if you're if you're not going to put the effort in you know how it's presented or making sure it's actually valuable it's it's a lot of wasted mm -hmm. time and i know people who put a lot of effort um in posting information but then it's very like surface level and it's like, who is this actually for? Um, Cause that's the yeah. hard part, right? That's really, really hard. It's like, who is this actually, oh, yeah. who is this serving really? It's too vague. Yeah. It doesn't say, cause like you, like you said, you know, oh, you know, we can help you do the branding. I don't care about like about branding my whatever is not working or I have a conference yeah. happening in two weeks and I'm not ready because I need a presentation and, and you're talking to me about branding. So I, I don't know, like there's, <laughs> I'm sure you do lots of customer personas for, for clients as well. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, how to determine what types of people you're attracting or looking to, um, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. I'm so happy that you were able to to join us, Helen, um, uh, on this call. You know, the podcast, we, we seek to help people who are trying to, uh, you know, level up on their business endeavors. And I think you're one of those people that everyone needs to have in the Rolodex just because your content is so valuable and helpful and like laser focused and it really does uh help people so please let people know where they can find you how can they connect with you 
Okay, yeah. So um, I'm on Instagram uh, and LinkedIn mainly. And uh, yeah, my business is obviously called Creative Business Brain. Um, I've also got a Facebook group if you wanted to pop in there and say hi. Um, <laughs> so they're the main places where, where you can find me. Um, yeah, so just even if you just put my name, uh, Helen Knight, into LinkedIn, you'd find me. Nice. Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, guys, this has been the More Life podcast. Welcome to season five. We're excited that you're here. Um, have a great week. Peace out. Bye. Excellent.